it's okay to have conflict. Conflict happens in every environment. The only question is, do you know about it? And are you doing something to fix it? That's it. Because most times you don't know about it, and therefore you're not doing anything to fix it. If I work with people, they at some point will get frustrated with me. And either they tell me or they don't. And if they tell me, and I'm willing to look at it as a gift and learn from it, then I can fix it. But if I don't hear it, then I can't fix it. You're listening to the Enterprise Ready Podcast, a show aiming to change the enterprise software narrative from how to sell to enterprises to how to build for enterprises. We'll interview industry experts and enterprise software founders as we break through the jargon, establish a common vernacular, and share the lessons learned from building the world's best enterprise software. Hi, I'm Grant Miller, creator of Enterprise Ready and founder and CEO of Replicated, where we enable cloud-native software vendors like HashiCorp, CircleCI, Sneak, and many others to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem applications. Check us out at replicated.com. The Enterprise Ready podcast is brought to you by Heavybit, a program dedicated to helping startups take their developer products to market. For more information, visit heavybit.com. If you're interested in being a guest on the show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. All right, folks, we're back after a bit of a hiatus. It was a challenging few months, uh, but I'm incredibly excited to share this episode with you. Today, we have Matt Mushari, who has founded several businesses, but came to my attention due to his work as an executive coach and as the author of The Great CEO Within. We talk a lot about the book because I think it is hands down the best operational guide to building and scaling an enterprise software company that's out there. I've read it several times and I've shared it with many, many founders and execs. We cover so many interesting topics throughout, but I'll try to give you a quick preview here. The value of exec coaching, the secrets of onboarding a great COO or chief of staff, how to get team alignment around areas of responsibility, soliciting candid feedback, and doing customer-based product research, plus much, much more. And with that, I'm really excited to bring you the author of The Great CEO Within, Matt Moshari. All right, Matt, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having me. All right, let's uh, let's dive into your background a little bit. It's a bit of an, an unusual enterprise-ready podcast because you're not currently an operator, so this will be an, an interesting background, but I know you have some really extensive background and having started, you know, what became Verizon Business. So would love to get love to get your background here. So Grant, I hate to tell you, I actually am an operator. Oh, you are now. And I'm building enterprise software. Well, okay. There we go. Yeah. Even, this is even more relevant. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> so what part can I tell you about? I mean, yeah, just like, you know, I know you you graduated from college and then started the company, you know, kind of during the like the the first, you know, wave of the dot com boom. So like Give a bit of context around that. Internet 1.0. Yeah, 1.0. Yeah, talk talk about that, and then let's talk about what you're doing now too. Okay. So the the quick path from college to here was that I I did come to Silicon Valley back in the in the late 90s. Internet 1.0 was all the rage. I was an investor. I joined an investment firm, and I saw you know founders just succeeding left and right, and I thought I, that's what I want to be. And so I jumped onto that side and started a company called Totality, which was basically the same thing that Mark Andreessen and, and Ben Horowitz had done with LoudCloud. We basically started, I think in hindsight, we realized we started the same week, oh, funny. and uh, which was a great thing because they sort of, you know, raised the flag and sort of waved, this is an important thing, and, and they educated everyone. And then we were kind of like the, the sloppy seconds. We got all the leftovers, uh, <laughs> and uh, which is great. Didn't have to do any, you know, explain to anyone what, what this was all about. And so that went well. Um, sold the company. It was a, a great financial outcome, but frankly, it was a complete mess of an operation. My partner and I, Michael Carrier, we had no idea what we were doing. And we frankly did a terrible job of running the company. And so years later, I thought to myself, what, what could have gone better? How could we have done that right? Because of course, while we were doing it, there was no time to read or get educated. And so I just read a book and I read... Andy uh, Goh's book on um, high output management. And my jaw just dropped. I was like, oh my God, this is the answer. I could have just done this. And then I read Ben Horowitz's book and Hard Thing About Hard Things. I was like, oh my God, we face those exact things. Why didn't I just read this book first? 
Of course. Yeah, that wouldn't exist. Yeah. And wrote it afterwards, but that's okay. Minor detail. Yeah. And then I just started reading business book after business book, and every single one had some incredible nugget that just rang totally true to me. And I just started summarizing these books. But then I wanted to actually test them. Where can we actually see if this really works in real life? I didn't want to start another company, but I thought, well, maybe if I start coaching companies, then I can test out these theories in them. They can be my guinea pigs. <laughs> and so that's what I started doing. But of course, at first, no one, I didn't think anyone would want me to coach them because I'm not a coach. And so I went on to Stanford campus and started coaching students, current students who had started companies, but they couldn't get into YC because YC doesn't accept students. And so mm. started coaching those folks and these things started working. And then, so, you know, I think I migrated up the food chain until, you know, now I'm coaching bigger companies and, and CEOs of bigger companies, but that's where it all started. And it turns out that, you know, each thing I tested, it worked. And so I just kept reading more books and summarizing them and putting the ideas in it. And it, to this day, you know, Reed Hastings comes out with his, his book, read it, go, Oh my gosh, there are new things in there. That was fantastic. Let's start trying those out. And they work. And then Frank Slootman comes out with his book, Amp It Up. Oh my God, they're great ideas here. Start using those. They work. And so I haven't invented anything at all. All I've done is ingested what other people have created, experimented with it, and that's it. That's all I've done. I love it. Great artists steal, right? That's the that's the that's the goal. I mean, so you know, and, and I I was I'm trying to remember who sent me the the book first, but someone sent me the Google Doc, yeah, three or four years ago. I read it on like you know, basically I couldn't put it down. It was it, I just felt like it was everything that I needed to be doing. Some things that I was like, oh, we did that, and that's why that worked. But and then a lot of things I was like, oh, I wish I was doing that better. And I've since probably sent it to I don't know fifty different founders as like a kind of an operational guide to growing up and becoming. It was first called from founder to CEO, and I think that you know that was like that really rung with me because it, it was like, hey, you're making this transition as a founder and you have to become a CEO at some point because those, they actually are two very different things. Uh, and now it's called the great CEO within, um, you know, and it's available on Amazon. There's an audible, which I'm like a, a big audio audiobook person. So I was like very thrilled that there was an audio version. So I listened to that a couple of times as well, because it's just like something I can put on while I'm doing other things and like, you know, kind of occupies my mind, but I love that, you know, there's a Google doc and now you just sent me another, you know, open source link that you created called the Mashari method. You know, I'm excited to dig into that this weekend. So, you know, and I think for most founders and operators, and again, I, I was mentioning I had my entire exec team read read the book by last week. And it's just, it's best practices for what many of us should be doing in how we actually operationalize our businesses. And it's like, you know, even if you're too small to implement all of them today, it's knowing that they exist and being ready to implement them later, I think is super important. And then having this as a resource you can come back to. And then Matt's always updating this as well. And so it's a, I love this. I think this is a, a massive, you know, benefit for the community. It's, you know, we, we created enterprise ready because we wanted to share things that we had learned about building enterprise software and, you know, all these, the nuances of these different features. And I think this book and, and your sort of general uh, philosophy is so in line with that. Because it's, you know, it's like, hey, we can actually move faster. We can create more value for the world if we actually are operating, you know, effectively and not trying to relearn everything over and over again. True, true. And, and the book, uh, first of all, it's a terrible title. Uh, Founder to CEO is a good title. It turns out, unfortunately, that was already taken. Um, so then I had to shift to a, another title, which, you know, I've seen comments on Amazon like, great book, terrible title. And I go, you know what? It, they're right. It is a terrible title, but oh well, it's already out there. And, uh, and the, the book really is targeted towards a company that once it starts scaling humans, so it's hit product market fit already. I, I don't want to spend time on product market fit because Bill Owlett and Discipline Entrepreneurship does such a great job there. Like mm -hmm. why recreate the wheel? Um, so people should just, if they're pre product market fit, they should just go to Bill Owlett's book. Um, but mine is, I didn't see anything that was comprehensive for post product market fit once you started hiring a bunch of people. Because really, that's when the, the people problems begin. Once you are more than 20 people in a room or you're remote, either one of those situations, people don't just automatically and organically hear, overhear the CEO's conversations and therefore understand what the CEO's priorities are. And the CEO doesn't organically overhear the frontline folks's 
conversations and therefore understand what problems they're facing to unblock them. And so all of a sudden that communication, which is critical, breaks down unless you have a system. Mm. So that's all this is, is describing a system that creates that information flow back and forth. But there is another way. And everyone I coach, I, this is the first thing I say to them if they're still small. Unfortunately, now I usually just coach companies that are hundreds or even thousands of people so that, you know, the ship has already left the, left the port. But the real answer here is don't hire people. And I know that sounds crazy. And I know that sounds like, wait, Matt, but you know, we've got this product that's, you know, flying off the shelf. And so we need, you know, customer support and we need, you know, a sales team to go sell even more. And then we need more engineers to build all the features that we promised everybody. And we've got to do this. And my answer is, no, you don't. And so there, there are examples of company. Well, maybe, maybe there aren't examples yet, but I'm hoping to create an example in real time. That, that doesn't hire a lot of people because that is the easiest way to avoid the problems. I think it's almost an intellectual laziness that we go through and just say, let's just hire bodies. Because, I mean, let's take some real examples. Rippling does not have in-person customer success team. Don't have it. Mm. Now, is that a negative? Yeah. It's, I mean, people don't love that they don't have in-person customer success, but the product is so freaking good that it's sailing and scaling anyway. Mm. So they can actually afford to not have in-person customer service. That's one example. There are others. And so, yes, to date, it hasn't been done of keeping a team, you know, less than 20 people and having it be worth $10 billion. But it doesn't mean that it can't exist. Interesting. And I think it's just no one's tried. So I'm the, I'm going to try. Yeah, and I mean, and you mentioned you're building some enterprise software now. What are you building? Tell, tell us about that. So what happens is this book basically describes a way to run a company, both one-on-one meetings and team meetings and business reviews and feedback. I mean, everything. And so and it's all written out in Google Docs. And people, you know, when I coach someone, I first coach them one-on-one. And after three meetings, they're like, oh my God, my life is better. And they say, Matt, can you do anything else? I said, sure, I can show you how to do it in the, in the company with a team. So we do that for a few meetings. And all of a sudden, the team's operating better. And they say, this is great. This is mind-blowing. And then I say, okay, now you just roll it out to the company. And they say, Matt, I'm not you. I can't teach the way you taught me. Mm. So... I don't trust myself to teach. Therefore, instead of me teaching them, will you, Matt, please create software that will just, I can hit a button and it rolls the whole process out to the company. And, you know, the people who are asking me to do this were, you know, first of all, they were technical founders. Sure. And so they could write it themselves. And second of all, some of them had, you know, engineering teams with 500 engineers on them. And I said, why don't you make the software? And they said, no, 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 whatever. They didn't. So finally, after years, I said, okay, fine, I'll do it. And that's what I'm doing now. And we made great strides. And we're, we've got the one on one portion, the team portion is almost ready. And then we'll, I'm already using it with the people I coach and they all want it for the companies. It's almost ready to deploy company wide. That'll probably come in the next 60 days. But what I'm doing is also the things that, I say we should do to build great companies. And one of them is, if this is a problem that customers are feeling so painfully, then they should be willing to pay for it up front. Mm. And that's exactly what's happening here. So the CEOs that I'm working with are already paying basically in advance for the product so that I can hire the team. And so, because I didn't want to come out of pocket to create the solution. And so they funded it. That's great. Fund it with a uh, non-dilutive capital. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Customer demand. That's amazing. <laughs> right cool. Well, that's, that, that'll be exciting. We'll definitely try to, we'll keep the audience in, in the loop as that, uh, as that comes out and is, and is available for folks that, you know, sign up. Is there a beta or anything else they can sign up for? Well, no, that's another thing that I realized is when I looked at software, I came to the conclusion that I think software doesn't improve once it's got hundreds of thousands of users, hmm. because now you're dealing with, DevOps and security and to push code is just, you have to, you know, a lot of people have to approve it so that the process just slows way down. In which case, you know, a three person YC startup is always going to go faster because they don't have to worry about that. And they don't have to worry about brand. They can just try things, throw spaghetti at the wall and see if it works or not. And once you're out there with millions of users and you've got a brand to protect, all of a sudden 
people get fearful and move slower. Sure. And so I want to copy the Slack model. And what Slack did, at least my understanding is, is that they had a limited number of users for quite a long time, for one, two, three years, and just kept iterating and making the product better and better and better. Didn't have to worry about DevOps, didn't have to worry about security. And then finally, once the product couldn't get any better, then they released it to the world. And that's the model that I'm copying. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll uh, tune back in in three years and uh, we'll let everyone know whether they can find it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, I mean, so, you know, and I know you've worked with a, a variety of founders um, and, you know, you've worked on a variety of businesses, you know, for this audience specifically, right? So like enterprise software founders, enterprise software, you know, leaders, product folks, you know, when you look at, um, you know, your, your advice, I think is almost catered toward that audience. I'm sure there's some things in there that are like very broadly applicable, but, you know, some of the most interesting you know, pieces I'd love for you to talk a bit more about, like, you know, kind of how, how to get a founding team, build an individual habits, which I think like, you know, the getting things done method and all the d- different kind of productivity systems you list here and, and like suggestions are all gold. And like, that's the kind of things that like every successful person needs to be implementing. Then you get into group habits, some of which are like really interesting and challenging in terms of, you know, setting up you know, I think what was the what's the framework that you have for sort of more decision making, like a rapid framework, right? Rapids are issue, proposed solution, right? You know, pull, again, things that you didn't invent, but you pulled from you know folks that that created them, and then you know you said, hey, this is the best practice. You know, then you kind of start getting into that infrastructure around like how do you communicate and work as a group. And one of the things that like you know I hadn't done, but I think is really interesting. I'd love to get your advice on it. Is you have something you call areas of responsibility and sort of mapping areas of responsibility. So kind of talk about like what you would do as a an executive team to make that happen to get that you know kind of hey we're I mean replicated seven years in right and how do we then you know apply this areas of responsibility? What are the benefits it's going to bring to us? And you know what 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 are the pitfalls that we should watch out for when we start to do it? Yeah. So areas of responsibility is really just the flip side of an org chart. An org chart shows who reports to whom and therefore who does one-on-ones with whom, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't say what each person is specifically responsible for. So this is just basically page number two of an org chart. And what the benefits of it are is that it will surface conflict sooner. Right. So that instead of waiting for people, the whole company as a whole to drop the ball because no one knew who was responsible for blank, that gets surfaced earlier. Or more likely, two people thought they were responsible for something and then they're both doing it in a different way and then they got really pissed off at each other and then they come to you and say, and they're just angry and and you have to unpack that whole mess. Writing out these areas of responsibility, all it's going to do is surface that sooner so you can solve the crisis before people hate each other. Mm, okay. Now, sometimes it surfaces, you do the exercise and there's nothing surfaced. Like everything's right. Everything's doing what they're supposed to. There's no two people doing the same job and there's no holes. Great. So in that case, you don't want this exercise to take very long because there's a chance it doesn't actually show anything. And so in that, what I always do with exercises like this that feel like, how exactly are we supposed to do this? And I don't have time to do this. This is just one more piece of homework. Like, I'm, I'm running marketing. Don't, don't give me extra administrative bullshit that you heard from some idiot coach that's not going to improve my life in any way. And you're going to face that when you roll out areas of responsibility or many other of these exercises. So what I find the easiest thing to do is just take 15 minutes during a team meeting. And first, before it starts, before the meeting happens, I fill out my portion of the areas of responsibility sheet. I then in that First minute, I show it to everybody on the team and say, hey, guys, let's take the next five minutes for everyone to write in your section as I've written in mine. Everyone starts writing. Okay, now let's take a few minutes to read each other's. Now let's identify if there are any conflicts. If there are any conflicts, let's not deal with them here I'll do a one, you know, a two on one, which would ever, mm. you know, if we can deal with the conflict in one minute, great. But if it takes longer than that, let's just schedule a separate meeting outside because you're only going to identify one or two conflicts at most. And that's it. And so in 15 minutes, you can get your areas of responsibility, at least at the exec team level, written. And no one had to do any homework and no one had to figure out what the heck they're supposed to do because they saw your example. So they can just copy your example. 
And then everybody's happy and everyone says, oh, that only took 15 minutes. That was great. Thanks for doing that. Love that. If you do it any other way, if you give this to him as homework, oh my God, you will get lots of griping and lots of complaining. Yeah, that's, so that's, I love that. So that's, that's amazing advice. We'll, we'll be doing this with my executive team on Monday. So thank you. I guess the other piece here, you know, that I think is really interesting is there's just so many pieces of tactical advice in this book about like how to do exactly these things, right? So, you know, another piece that, you know, you should talk about, which is like receiving feedback from your team as a leader, just as anyone receiving feedback, that sort of the way that you, you know, accept it, repeat it, say thank you. I mean, like that to me really stuck as a powerful way to try to get more openness and feedback, which I think, you know, to your point, how do you create, you know, a, an environment where conflict happens, where people are engaging each other? So if you have any sort of thoughts or advice on like, you know, how to really create an open feedback environment? Yeah, it's got to start with the CEO. And, and by the way, it's not like you're creating an environment where it's okay to have conflict or, or conflict is allowed to happen. Conflict happens in every environment. Sure. The only question is, do you know about it? And are you doing something to fix it? That's it. Because most times you don't know about it and therefore you're not doing anything to fix it. And so the way I view it is if I work with people, they at some point will get frustrated with me and either they tell me or they don't. And if they tell me, and I'm willing to look at it as a gift and learn from it, then I can fix it. But if I don't hear it, then I can't fix it. And so my, and this has kind of been my secret weapon from the beginning, nothing I've done in this coaching world is something that I've invented. Either I've read books or I got suggestions from people who gave me feedback. Mm. So my CEOs, have, frankly, have crowdsourced all of this methodology. So what I need to do is first, I need to ask for the feedback. Obviously, no one's going to really give it to me if I don't ask. And by the way, if the ask is, hey, everybody, I'm open to feedback anytime. Just shoot me a Slack anytime. That's not asking for feedback. That's opening a fake door that no one's going to be willing to go through. Because remember, the first time someone gives you feedback, they don't know how you're going to react. And you have more power than they do. And you could fire them. Not only could you fire them, you could actually flame them publicly and make sure that they never have the job again. And don't think that they're not thinking that. That's exactly what they're thinking. So they're thinking to themselves, if I give this feedback, maybe the CEO takes it well and like improves a little bit. So that's like a positive one. Or maybe the CEO gets super defensive and then, you know, gets vengeful and tries to destroy me. And for me, that's like a minus 100. Right. So that's an asymmetric bet in the wrong direction. Right. No one's going to take that bet. Yeah. So it's not enough to say, hey, everyone, I'm available. You got to make it very specific. It's got to be on an agenda. It's like going to be an agenda item in a meeting. And I do it in my one on ones. And if I don't, I do it at the end so, you know, we can see how the meeting can get better. But if we don't get to it, it then becomes the very first agenda item in the next meeting. I also do it in every group meeting, I do it in every single meeting I'm in. Mm. And then not only is it an agenda item, but you have to go even further than that. You've got to make the person the very first time the person is still going to be scared shitless. So you've got to basically coax it out of them no matter how you can. My methodology is I say to the person, listen, I can't trust you until you give me negative feedback. Because mm. if you don't, then there's one of two possibilities. Either you think I'm God and I'm perfect or you're withholding. And I know I'm not God. So it means that you're withholding. So I'll tell you what, rather than go too intense, let's just have you think of it right now. I want you to think of the feedback that if you shared it with me would likely make me feel sad, hurt, angry, whatever it is, insulted, offended. I just want you to think of that. Do you have that? Do you have that in your brain chamber? And I'll say yes. Okay, great. Now I'd like you to say it to me. And then they do. <laughs> and what happens next is critical. It's critical that I then, whatever they say, I do two things. One, I reflect it back so I know that I actually understood what the heck they said. Yeah. And usually what I do is I make it much bigger. If someone says to me, hey, Matt, you know, I really wish you'd say hello to me when you saw me in the morning. Um, I go, okay. I think what I heard you say is you um, feel sadness or anger. And that the thought you have is, 
what the fuck is wrong with you, Matt? Like I, we work together. I come into the office. You don't even fucking say hello to me. What the fuck is, what the, how, what an asshole you are. God damn it. Can you just be, de- have the decency to say hello to me? Please do that. And then I'll say, is that right? And the person will say, well, it wasn't quite that big. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of right because it always is. The thoughts in our head are always a hundred times bigger than the words we're willing to say. And what happens is when I repeat back that much bigger version, the person goes, wow, Matt just said that back to me and he didn't get angry. Mm -hmm. He seemed to be fine with it. So now I've just created a huge, wide open space that is completely and utterly safe. They can the next time if they want to, they can swear at me like that and they know that I'll be fine with it. Mm -hmm. So now they can say anything. And then the second thing is, I just thank them sure. for being willing to share. But of course, the real thanks is that I don't get angry. The real right. thanks is that I accept it, that I acknowledge it, and that I am open to hearing it. And then after that, the next step for me is I declare to them whether I accept it or not. Now, this is also key. I don't always accept it. Even though I acknowledge what they say, like incredibly like raw, their actual thoughts doesn't mean I have to accept it because if I, if I had to accept it, that would be tyranny of the feedback giver. And we don't want that. Instead, what I do is I think, does it actually resonate with me? Now, most of the time it does. So most of the time I accept it. And if I accept it, then we brainstorm actions together of what I can do. And then I go do those actions. We write it down. I put it in my tracker. I do it. Later, I show them that I did it. Um, but occasionally I go, you know what? No, that doesn't resonate with me. Someone comes to me and says, Matt, my feedback for you is I wish you'd, you know, give me a million dollars a year, give me a raise to a million dollars a year. And I got my reflected back and I say, thank you. And then I say, you know what? I don't accept that. And, and here's why. And then I share with them why. I share with them my perspective, what's going on in my world, why their feedback doesn't resonate with me. Mm. And the feedback doesn't resonate with me because, hey, we're building a company here. We need it to be profitable. If, you know, first of all, a million dollars is not the, your market value for the job that you're doing. And in addition, if we gave you a million dollars a year, then there would be unprofitable and the business would go away. So whatever it is, I explain to the point where they go, oh, now I get it. I understand why why Matt doesn't accept. Like I wouldn't accept that either. And then you have resolution. And would you accept like at all with sort of like a, you know, a condition, a caveat or something like, hey, yeah, you know, I I would, I, I will absolutely say hello to you in the morning when I see you. But sometimes I'm like on a call and I might not, I might, you know, and I don't mean offense. Like I, I mean to say hi, if I, you know, or I'm in a, in, a, in a deep thought, like, is that like a, would you provide that like asterisk or just? Yeah, say? absolutely. I accept in these situations and I don't accept in those situations. Great. And, and I'll explain to you what those situations are and why. And you'll see, of course, yes, I can't accept in those situations. Right. And I love this idea of not just mirroring back what you've heard, but kind of mirroring and amplifying it back. Because to your point, I, I hadn't thought about that idea that like, hey, even when you're giving that critical feedback, you're still softening it as much as you can. So you're taking that like and minimizing it. Oh, maybe they'll accept this, you know, side of it and they'll see this. But really you're thinking they've just squished down a, a you know, a, a 50 to a one to give it to me. And I got to bring it, I got to reinflate it. I got to rehydrate this thing with how they actually felt. That's exactly it. Rehydrate. I'm going to use that terminology from now on. That's a great way to think of it. All right. I like it. I, I, you don't, you don't have to credit me. I like, I like just, just being able to, I, I love your, I love your book because you just like, you have so many founders that have just contributed to it. I love this like constant improvement that I see. It's just, you're like, yep, some new thing, the new matter where to say it. Like, I'm going to put it down. It's, it's great. I love that. Awesome. Okay. So I, I, I love that. It's super interesting. There was another piece in here that I was going to dive into. One thing I was thinking about. When I had my team read it, right? One, it feels a little bit weird to be like, yeah, here's a book, you know, it's about being a great CEO and like, but you should read it. But one, I want them to know everything that I'm thinking about, how I'm thinking about running the business and how I would love us to like kind of go do these things and know what each other's kind of various responsibilities are. Two, I do actually think that like, you know, somebody said like, I'm not you, but I, I do think as CEOs, we have to sort of coach our executives to help make them better, right? So, you know, when you think about a, and, and really, if you're, and if you're a, uh, an executive, you're coaching your, you know, your directors and VPs to make them better. And so, like, everyone's really doing this level of coaching. So, when you think about, you know, like that idea, to why I guess one, do you, is that, does that resonate? Do you agree with that? Totally. 
It's the number right. one that all CEOs of scaled companies have. I need to make my managers into great managers, and I don't know how. Great. And so, you know, let's let's dig into that a little bit. I have to know it's a pretty big topic, but not just great managers. Like how do you how do you really coach them? You know, like what are your top things you're thinking about? I know you talked about. Uh, you know, Andy Grove's book and some other pieces around management, but like, what else are you really trying to help them accomplish? Is it the same thing? Like, Hey, you should, everyone should be the CEO of their own, you know, line of business and this just apply this down and it, and it sort of trickles down and everyone needs these habits. Everyone needs these kind of group dynamics. And this is just, you know, cascades all the way down. Yes. I love that. So, sorry to give a one word answer, but that is the answer. Yeah. And, and so on that, I mean, maybe expand a little bit. One of the key things also is not only rinse, wash, repeat, you can all can do this, but having a uniform method throughout the company has incredible advantages. One is, is that now everyone in the company knows where to find information because they know where to find information for their own department, their own team, their own management report. Now they know where to find information from other people's. And two, it allows people to have a similar vocabulary and way of dealing with conflict, decisions, set communication, et cetera. And so I think of examples like one of the smartest things I think that Zuckerberg did early on in Facebook was he said, I'm not a manager. I've never managed anything. I've never had a job before. And I've got this early team. They're all young. They're all they're amazing, but they they've never managed anybody before. We need someone to come in who can manage. Now most people at that level would have hired a VP of marketing. They would have hired a CFO. They would have hired, you know, for one domain, an executive who could then at least, they could then watch and sort of maybe pull off of, or, or just would manage that department well. Sure. The problem with bringing the executive to just one department is they bring, they put that, their style and their methodology in that department. Then you hire another person to run marketing. They manage it in their style. Then you hire another person to run engineering. They manage it in their style. And by the way, all these styles are different. And now you've got competing styles. And it, in the end, what happens is they don't intermesh well at all. Mm. Instead, what Mark did was he said, I'm going to hire a manager to come in and manage the entire team and teach us all one methodology. I don't know if he did this consciously, but it certainly was the result. And now other people can consciously copy it because it is the single answer. When people come and and ask, Matt, can you please coach me? All they're really saying is, I'm unwilling to hire a Sheriff Sandberg. Instead, Matt, can you please coach me? And I push back on all of them. I say, you realize that hiring a Sheriff Sandberg is a much better solution because you know, coach with me and you get to talk to me, you know, once a month and I'm just talking, not showing. Whereas Cheryl is actually doing it and she's there every day and everyone, like all the answers, questions are getting answered. And then at some point, if you see what she's doing is effective and you get excited and you want to run the system, you just say to her, Cheryl, thanks very much. I'd like to take over running the system, but I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen because almost every founder that I know loves product, and that's it. (laughs) They love to get to know customer problems, figure out how to solve those pains, and then create the solution to solve them. What they don't like is, let's go through this checklist, and and let's hold people accountable, and let's make sure, let's hurt all the cats, and make sure everyone pre-prepared for the meeting, and then let's follow up and do conflict resolution with people. Like, all that stuff, ugh. Like, it's clearly necessary, but... I know maybe two founders that enjoy doing that. Mm. And the other 98 that I know hate it. And if you hate something, you're not going to do it well. And so my advice to all of them is find someone else to do it. Now, when you find someone else to do it, there's also a big danger. The big danger is you hire someone from the outside to come in and day one, they start on the job. They don't know who the customer is. They don't know what the pain is. They don't know your solution. And now you're asking them to make decisions or coordinate decisions, and they have no context. Well, 50% of the time, they fail. So I don't recommend that. What I do recommend is hire someone, have them sit and shadow you, the CEO, for 90 days. Oh, wow. It'll be very painful for them. Easy for you. As CEO, you don't have to do anything. They just watch you. 
and they sit in on all your meetings and they learn and they start to absorb who the customer is, what the pain is, and what your solution is. And then also you can start to, after 30 or 60 days, you can start to, they can start to run meetings and you can observe how they do it. So you can start to, and give them feedback. And by the end, so you shift. First they watch you, then you watch them. And by the end of 90 days, you will have a mind melt. You will totally and utterly trust them because you'll see that they actually have the full context and then they can run the company. And the results from that have been phenomenal. Interesting. I mean, you're not wrong. This is a very, like, this feels like every founder I know and everything, you know, everyone else. I think that many of us basically come to the realization that, like, we have to do it. We just have to, like, make this part of what we're going to do. And it's just, like, part of us. And that's the, and to me, I mean, interestingly, that is sort of the transition from founder to CEO, right? Like, that's the, it, it is making this decision to actually take these actions on. And I guess your point is, like, Hey, if you want to stay in founder mode and like go be creative and build solve customer problems all day long, like you can still be a CEO, just hire this person to do all of this other work. That's exactly right. And by the way, I posit you'll create way more value by staying in founder mode. Yeah. Because you'll create the next level, the next solution. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I mean, what kind of background do you love for that person that you're that you're talking about, that sort of COO? Oh my gosh. It, it's what I've discovered is the bar is actually pretty damn low. <laughs> and I used to think that this person had to be amazing, but now I'm realizing that they have to be a, a manager who's managed successfully before. And that's it. And there isn't any magical because it's the shadowing of you. That's the magic. It's that transfer of knowledge which is the 90% correlation to success, Mm. not their previous background. And so it's like they're a successful manager. You trust them there. They they might not have any experience in your industry or your, you know, like, and, and you're like, give them 90 days to shadow, they'll learn, they'll figure it out. And then they're going to be super successful. Yes. Interesting. So far it's a hundred percent success rate. Now we've only been doing this version for the past since, April of 2021 was when this sort of idea first appeared. And I had to convince my coachees to start trying this. Mm. And so about half of them have so far. And those half are like, oh my God, this, this is amazing. Totally works. Now, not half have gone full COO, but half have been had whatever executives they've hired since then, they've had shadow either them, this part-time the CEO and part-time the person who was currently doing the role. Mm. And the, the results have been 100% success for onboarding executives that way. I like that as a, as a consideration. It, it does feel... Radical. Yeah, it does. It feels like, you know, and it's like, it's a big, it's a big, big decision. So I guess, is it a one-way door or is it a two-way door? How do you think about that? I think it's very much a one-way door. Okay. Eric Schmidt came into Google and Larry Page, after a bunch of years, said, you know what? I think I'd like to take back over. Okay. He could have done that after not 10 years, but 10 days if he wanted to. Okay. So you, so you think you can, you can, you can take it back. Okay, Absolutely. It. Great. Absolutely. Great. And there's another easier way to test this. And that is, and this is how we discovered this in the first place, is that I realized that what I was doing was I was teaching founders how to run a company. And once they felt the impact of the system in a one-on-one. Like by the third meeting, the founder's life was just better. And they said, Matt, the system is amazing. I love it. And then same thing with the team. You know, after three, four meetings with the team, the team's just, it's performing better. And they go, that's awesome. But then they would come to me and say, Matt, I really want this in the company, but I don't want to be the one to run it. I.e., that's when they said, can you please build software? Sure. And I said, well, then we've got to find the person to run it because there wasn't any software. And we've got to teach them. So I had to, re, you know, redo the whole process. And I said, well, this is stupid. I'm just, you know, just, that was not efficient. So then what I started doing was requiring that the CEO have someone attend all of our meetings. And we made that person, we called him chief of staff. Mm-hmm. And by the end, if it worked and the CEO loved the process, he would just turn to the chief of staff and say, can you please now run it? And so then they would, and they would implement it in the company. And so what we found then that works so well that I basically now make it a requirement 
if I'm going to coach you, and now I have two other coaches, by the way, that I've taken on who are even better than I am. And uh, what we did was I required that they get a chief of staff before we start coaching. And what we found was, is that chief of staff, there was like a 100% success rate on how they turned out. Meanwhile, the executives that were getting hired was like a 50% success rate. And I asked myself, why? And what I realized, the only difference was these chief of staffs that got hired were very junior people. They were oftentimes in their 20s. Yes, they had like good backgrounds. A lot of them were consultants from McKinsey and BCG and Bain. Sure. But they had no relevant, they'd never run anything on the technology side or managed a team before. But just the mind meld that happened in the shadowing process created so much trust between them and the CEO that the CEO didn't have to second guess. Well, frankly, the decisions that the chief of staff made once they went and ran and ran a department were phenomenal. And so that's when it clicked in my brain. Oh, it's context. Oh, it's having the same information the CEO does. Because it turns out the CEO is not smarter than everybody else. The CEO just sees all the information and he's, and he or she is the only one. And if everyone else could see all that information, they would make the same decisions or frankly, better ones. I say this all the time. Oh, I, I totally agree. I, it's all context. I, I, it's like, Hey, look, it's, and, and when I'm like, Hey, I'm going to make a different decision because you just didn't have this context. It's like people sort of, I think, give too much credit to CEOs. It's like, we, no, we just have all the context. That's all it is. It's like, there's nothing that special about any of us. It's like, you know, there's nothing magical. We're not, you know, sure, we're smart. Maybe we took some extra risk in the beginning if you're a founder, but like realistically, you just have all the context. And like with that context, most of these smart people would make very similar decisions if they're good decisions. That's exactly right. I love that. Now, let me for a second go down that side route that I was about to go down. Okay. So one of the things that's happened over time is people have asked, I have very limited capacity. And so I can coach maybe 20 CEOs at a time. And that, if I coach CEOs, that means I'm not coaching any individual exec team. So I'm not doing the Bill Campbell thing where he would go into Google and he would coach every single member of the exec team, sit in an exec team meetings. And it's a very valuable thing that he did. Sure. Arguably creating a lot more value than I'm creating. Um, And I have done that in the past. And when I've done it in the past, it's been incredibly valuable. But selfishly, I'm more interested in having more relationships with founders. And so if I do an exec team that's 10 founders that I can't be coaching during that time. Sure. So I choose selfishly what's good for me and I choose founders only, but I want to help my founders solve their problem and their problem could be easily solved if I were somehow able to replicate myself and have that person go in and coach all their exec team members and do the Bill Campbell thing. Sure. And so people have said to me, Matt, you know, you're, you're not replicatable. You're unique. There's no one like you in the world and no one, you know, it's not possible to do this. And I thought to myself, I don't think that's true. In fact, I think I'm very replicatable. And so I tried. And so in January, I collected 12 people together and and ran a boot camp to see if I could share what it is that I do. And the results were outrageous. And from that group, I hired two people. They're now full-time coaches. They're already coaching CEOs. And the results that they're getting back are phenomenal. And I, I, what I do now is I'll meet for the first time with a CEO just to sort of show them what the value can be. And then I say to them, okay. And they'll say, Matt, this was amazing. You know, that's exactly what I thought you would be able to do with me. And, you know, in the first meeting, I say, okay, now I'd like you to go and spend the next meeting with Alexis or Sabrina. And they'll go, no, no, you know, I only want you, Matt. I'll go, please. There's one. And I'm going to make a bet with you. My bet is, is that after that meeting, you will realize that they are actually better than I am. And the person says, no, that's impossible. There's no way. Okay, great. Well, then let's make the bet. So we make the bet. And the I and now I'm getting texts and emails from those CEOs saying, Matt, you won the bet. Wow, that's great. Did you uh, have them shadow you for, for 90 days in order to get all your context? Not even. <laughs> <laughs> but they shadowed me in coaching. Absolutely. They didn't shadow me okay, in, in the managing of the company, but they shadowed me in coaching. Yes, for sure. In coaching. Okay, they did. Okay, great. Yes. So, you know, I've always had this philosophy, especially recently when I saw one of my execs like hired a, a like basically I hired a CRO, he hired a VP pretty quickly. And it was like a really great pair. And like that, and I kind of realized that like having my exec team 
all have like a, you know, a lieutenant, you know, sort of like second in command that they are, is like a, a somewhat of a peer almost, right? Like someone that really helps them, you know, run their org. I find that to be incredibly, incredibly helpful for them. Kind of a similar concept of the CEO, COO, right? Yeah. And, you know, because you, you, there's different things and you want to talk to people. I actually try to push our team to pair a lot. I'm like, just get on a Zoom and like write the thing together. Do whatever you're going to do. Just like do it together. I'm like, don't get 10 people in, but do it with two people. Yes. Maybe three at most, but like do it with two people and like actually do work together because we're all remote. Yes. And working, it's like being on a whiteboard, except you're on a Google Doc and you're actually getting a bunch of stuff done together. Yeah. yeah. Phenomenal. Do you see like, you know, what, what are the other patterns that you see that really create kind of like great, effective teams, you know, that are, that are, you know, sort of unique and different? Like, is it, you know, hey, everybody gets a, an ops person, everybody gets like a, you know, that partner, like what are the other kind of things we should be thinking about implementing to make our, our executives even more successful? Yeah, well, Sonder is going in this direction. What they realized is, is that it's even more sort of specific. They realized, well, they've had an agreement tracker from day one. So they use Asana throughout the entire company. And I'm not advocating for one tool over the other, you know, ClickUp and Monday and Asana, they're all great. Notion and Coda, they're all great. Sure. But having one central tool that everybody uses to track agreements that they've made mm. so that all people can see that all other, what all others are doing and nothing falls through the cracks. And it's been very effective. For Sonder. The problem is, is that, you know, Asana is not the easiest tool to use. None of these tools are super easy to use. Sure. So people don't actually completely fill them out. And, you know, they, Sonder now uses the Asana for meetings as well, for agendas. And that's even harder to fill out. Mm -hmm. So what they decided to do was rather than scrap the tool, they simply were going to add the humans that would enable people to use the tool effectively. If Superhuman gives you a customer success agent to sit with you while you first use the tool for 30 minutes, right? Sonder hires an ops person for every single department to help all members of the team successfully use Asana each week. And they're just starting it now, but my, my guess is the results are going to be it, very effective, very good. Now, it's an expensive solution. It's a lot of humans. But my guess is it's going to be completely and utterly worth it. But even to your point there, which is just like training your team on how to use your tools effectively and making sure that's an important part of your onboarding process is just, I mean, no one does it. It's funny. I, I think about the superhuman onboarding as well. And I was like, this is just good email like usage. Like you're just teaching people how to do email well because most people don't have great habits. It's like think about Google Docs, think about, you know, Asana, any of these tools you're using that are like foundational for how your team works. You probably have a slight, you know, variation. Maybe they came from a Microsoft shop. Maybe they used it differently. Maybe they, you know, they had shared drives versus shared folders. And like there's all these different permutations and configurations. And so really spending time to onboard people into how your tools work is a a massive leverage point, right? If you can get everyone working consistently together, I love that. That's really great. Right on. And you probably don't even need to do a, a full-time person, but even just like having like, you know, a, a regular training on it. Yes. But really sitting, I mean, do you, almost like you kind of have to do it one-on-one -on -one though. Like I kind of realize doing a group training is really hard because people just don't pay as much attention. True, unless you force people to do the clicks. I mean, there's there's group training around learning how to code. Sure. And so if, if you can teach someone how to code in a group, you can teach someone how to use a tool in a group. Yeah. I mean, you, you, but you, you almost seem to like watch, the, like, hey, screen share with me and show me what you're doing. And like, like, yes. and like that's exactly. Well, you watch me do it. Now I watch you do it. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I love that. Maybe, we'll, maybe we'll, we'll try that out at Replicate and report back how that works. Sounds great. Let's talk about product. Because, sure. you know, you talked about, hey, this is what CEOs want to do. This is where you think you can, if you really create a great product, you know, Naval had a great tweet recently, which a lot of people disagree with, but it was something like, you're doing sales because you failed at marketing. That's right. You're doing marketing because you failed the product. Yeah, right. that's exactly it. So how do you think about, you know, doing product, particularly, you know, kind of B2B enterprise software kind of product, a little less consumer, but like, how do you think about really orchestrating that team, really kind of creating customer value what are your, you know, what's, what's your kind of advice here for, for founders to, to do product really well? Yeah, I've only discovered one way to do product. 
And I'm looking for others. I just haven't found them yet that work. And for me, the way to do product is go talk to people that I think I might want them to be my customer. Sit with them and understand the pain they're experiencing. Start to see commonalities of the pain they're experiencing across several customers. Put them in different groups by whatever category of pain they're experiencing. And then what solutions exist for them. Then pick the group that has the most pain, the biggest wallet, able to pay for the solution that pain and the least good solution available to them today. And then I simply solve their pain for them. And I do it manually at first. And I don't worry about automating it in the beginning. I just see if I really can solve their problem. And they pay me for it. And then if I can solve their problem manually, then I figure out how to solve their problem in an automated basis. That's it. That's the only way that I know how to do product. And and the thing is, is that that is not a one-time effort. That is a continual effort. And even so, once you have a product that's working, you have product market fit, and you have your customers, there's not even a requirement. There, there's where I've seen massive value created is then go through that whole process again mm. from scratch. Like ask yourself, what customers do you want to have? You may not, you may now that you have these customers, you may realize, you know what? Mm, these aren't necessarily the best customers. Here's an example. Hospitals. You have a, a hospital, a, a platform for hospitals and you, and you, that's what you're, you, you want to solve that problem. You, you, you figure out that they don't know how to analyze information that comes in and you create AI to, to solve that problem for them, you create a platform so it alerts the necessary specialists way ahead of time that they otherwise would. And great, you've solved that problem. But then you realize, oh man, these hospitals, most of them are public. So they're like run by a bureaucracy. So decision-making is super slow. When I say public, I mean, sorry, not for profit. So there's a really slow bureaucratic decision-making process. Right. Most of them are near bankrupt. So they don't actually even have any money. So therefore they can't pay much for solutions. And you know, what a terrible combination. So then you go, well, wait a second, who would I like to have as a customer? Well, pharmaceutical companies and device manufacturers, those guys are all private, make decisions instantly, and they have gobs of money and therefore would absolutely pay huge amounts to have their problem solved. Then you go talk to them and realize, oh man, that not only do they have a problem, but I have a solution because in order to really solve their problem, you'd need to have all the eyeballs of all the doctors in the country. And you know what? I've got that because I have this platform in hospitals. And so the biggest challenge with creating a, a massively valuable company, a trillion dollar company, is it's got to be a monopoly, period, end of story. I mean, Peter Thiel, zero to one, he, he showed us that. Yeah, yeah. Well, how the hell do you create a monopoly? It's like, that's a, an incredibly hard thing to do. So you need a moat. Well, how do you create a moat? I mean, maybe do like network effects like Facebook, but maybe your business has that, maybe it doesn't. Well, here's a really easy way to create a moat. You have a base product that works, and then you go talk to these customers and realize the really good ones and realize, oh my gosh, they have a problem that I can solve, but only, you could only solve it if you had a platform in hospitals. Mm. Well, who the hell is going to be able to go create a platform in hospitals and then solve the pain of the pharmaceutical device companies? Now you've created a moat because you create a two-step process that is basically impossible to replicate. And so I advocate for doing the product discovery, the pain discovery process on a regular basis, not just with your customers, but the customers you really want. Interesting. Yeah. No, that resonates. I mean, you know, for, for me particularly, just in our, in our, in our situation. So, and, and, and I, I'm not, I don't want to name those are, that's, that was a real example, by the way. Oh, interesting. And so I'm not going to name the name. Yeah. But, and, and what will happen is just like with my company, with pharmaceutical and device companies, have basically prepaid hmm. this healthcare platform company to create the solution for them because they see it as well. They see that this is the only company that can really solve their problem. Hmm. And then because you had that sort of second step, no one else is going to be able to come along and compete with you. And then that's how you create a lot of value because you're, you know, you can act as a, 
we'll call it ethical monopoly, right? Because it's like, realistically, you're, you're just trying to create more value for folks that wasn't attainable before. So that's exactly right. Yeah, I like it. The, the other thing I'm really curious about that I think you sort of have is you, you've sat across, you've worked with so many CEOs, right? And you've have this visibility. And it, you, I know you've talked about sort of like the most CEOs want to stay in product, you know, but like, what are the other sort of characteristics that you identify that have made, you know, that you think, hey, the, my best CEOs that are on the fastest trajectory, of course, like those product market fit, you know, probably floats a lot of boats. But what, what are the other, you know, kind of things about those CEOs that you think are just the, the, the characteristics that help drive the most success? Yeah. The CEO role that we traditionally think of has a whole list of elements. You've got to fundraise. You've got to create the vision for the company and document it so that everyone can understand it. We're all marching towards the same North Star. You've got to hire and manage the executive team. You've got to make sure the product roadmap is marching toward the North Star. You've got to... Like, there are a whole bunch of things that we think of traditionally as CEO. The CEOs that I work with that are the most successful, in the end, they all get there. But the ones who are most successful are the ones who realize quickest that they don't have to do every one of those roles as CEO. They just have to make sure that those roles get done. Mm. And the ones who are willing to admit there are these three things that I just freaking hate doing. And they're willing to give those away to someone who loves doing them. That's it. And then once they do that, the quality goes up tremendously. The A, those things actually get done, and B, they get done well. Yeah. And that begins the flywheel. And then the CEO realizes, oh my God, I can do that with not only things I hate, things that I just, just don't love. And they start giving those things away. And then in the end, the CEO, the only things they have left are the things they absolutely love to do. And by the way, are therefore really good at them and therefore create tremendous value. Yeah. That's the formula for success that I've seen or most success. And this is, this is sort of like zone of genius kind of concept, right? And that, Absolutely. And I think maybe you, you, that was from the uh, conscious leadership book. Is it right? That's where I first heard about it. Yeah. 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 Great. I mean, the other thing that's interesting, I just, as a sort of a, a parallel to enterprise ready with what were a lot of things we're talking about. Like I read all the books that you suggested as well. Like, you know, because I think that those were, you know, kind of additional deeper, you know, kind of detail on like, Hey, here's the method, but then here's all the kind of source materials. And the interesting thing about just your, you know, your guide and then those books together, if you do read all of it, like, I feel like what you end up with is a common vernacular for like how to talk about these different challenges that businesses face. And that's actually why I asked my, uh, my executive team to read it because I want us to be able to talk about these approaches. And we don't necessarily have to do every one of them, right? Like, and you know, you kind of have a handful of different individual productivity ones that you suggest, you know, there's some different ways to do, you know, group decision making. But like the idea of having like a framework to pick from, like a menu of like, hey, here's a different a couple different ways. These are the things we've seen to be most most successful. You know, this is the most popular item on the menu. But you know, if that doesn't work for you, here's some different options. And then being able to talk about it, about how it might impact your your company or your specific use case. And having that vernacular, I think is why this is so valuable to me and probably most other founders and executive teams. And realistically, at some point, I'll, I'll probably, you know, in a week or two, have the entire company read it because I think it's it's that important that we all get on the same page around what we all are trying to accomplish and what we're doing when we run this organization. I agree. I agree that having a common handbook right. that everyone's read and understands is if that's your North Star, then you can all march, march toward the same location. And if only one person has the handbook in their head and is telling everybody, uh, first of all, it, it feels like that doesn't feel good. Like I don't want to be told what to do. Right. And, but if I've read something and I go, Oh, that resonates with me, that feels much better. And then as a group, we do it together. We're all equals on this journey. Yeah. I mean, in, in, like when I first read the book, I think the other thing that it did, it reminded me of when I first read the ISO 27,000, like, um, which is like a, a basic guide for security pra- practitioners. When I first read that, like cover to cover, I was like, oh, wait, this is basically what every security professional asks for every SaaS and software company when they go in to talk about security. And I was like, now I have 
the questions and the answers. So like when they go and talk to me, I just like, well, we do some of those things and then we talk about it in the same language and you pass every security review. And it's kind of a similar idea with this. It was like, oh, these are actually all the answers to the challenges that I've had in actually running this business. So now I just need to like, hey, I have the answers. Now let's take it to the team and like talk about implementing the answers. And then that becomes like how you run your business over time. Makes sense. Yeah, I mean, it's it's... Again, I, I really do appreciate the, the work that you've done here. Like there are very few things that I have ever come across that I just think everyone who's going through this needs to know and understand. And this is one of those resources. And, you know, I love that you made it a Google Doc to start off, right? And made it so that people could, you know, it wasn't a PDF. It wasn't like a, you know, only available as a book. It's like you made it a Google Doc so that people could come in I made a copy of it, you know, used it, read it, like put it on my Kindle, everything else. So thank you for for that. It's it's a really valuable contribution to the entire ecosystem. My, my pleasure. Thank you. I, I tell you what, I think everyone should release their material open source that way. I mean, I guess if you're an author and you're counting on, you know, that's your bread and butter and that's how you make your living, you may not want to do that. But for any of us non-professional authors... I just want people to know this stuff. So why wouldn't I release it for free and make it as widely available as possible? And the benefits that come back to me are that now everybody, like when I go in to coach someone, most of the time they already know the material. They've already started working with the material. It just, we just get so much further faster, yeah. which is more fun for me. Like what I get joy from is helping CEOs create tremendous value in their companies. And if we start at zero, that's a heck of a lot less fun than starting at 98. And starting at 98 and get... Because the real fun is getting close to 100. And so I just want more and more people to know this stuff. You're right, though. And the idea... I and mean, this is... It's basically incredible content marketing, right? Like, and that's what... You know, that's why we created Enterprise Ready. Because we're like, hey, look, this is very much... Our customers will read it. Our customers will listen. And, you know, you accrue value to us eventually. And it's like, you put out great things, you create value for the world. And turns out, like, you create a bunch of value by making this a, uh, you know, freely available thing. That value, some percentage of it comes back to you over time. That's just the way the world works. And, you know, people will, you know, you, and, and I think that because people often ask us about how we created enterprise ready. And I'm like, well, I just sat down and wrote it like, you know, nights and weekends when I was running the company and it's a lot of work and it's like probably, you know, a quarter of the length of what you wrote. And so I know that this is... Which makes it four times better, by the way. No, 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 no. I the mean, shorter it is, the better it is. That I, this, I think I, I, there's not much that you could take out of what you have here. I mean, it, there's, you know, I took out a few things in the beginning. So like, well, my, my executive team doesn't need to know about how to create a founding team. But, you know, because we're, we already have a team. But like, there's, you know, but for our handbook, this is the foundation of it. So, yeah, thank you. I mean, any, anything else you want, you want to share with the audience or things you want to cover? No, this was great. This was super fun. Thank you for having me on. You're the best. Thank you so much, Matt. I really, really do appreciate it. Awesome. Great talking to you. That's all we have time for today. If you're interested in being a guest on this show, or if you'd like to suggest a topic, or just to learn more about enterprise features, find us at enterpriseready.io. To learn more about Heavybit, visit heavybit.com to check out the library. It's packed with amazing talks on sales, marketing, product, and general management from founders of developer tools companies and other industry leaders. This podcast is also brought to you by my company, Replicated, where we enable cloud-native software vendors like HashiCorp, CircleCI, Sneak, and many others to operationalize and scale the distribution of their modern on-prem applications to their largest enterprise customers. Check us out at replicated.com.